I'm happy to be here. Um, so today uh, I'm going to talk to you about considerations for collaborative robotics. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, I direct the ARM lab, which stands for the Assistive Robotics and Manipulation Laboratory. In our lab, we focus on three main research areas, robotic assistance, intelligent wearables, and connected devices, where the idea of robotic assistance is uh, you have these robots that are able to enable and amplify the efforts of a human collaborator or possibly perform a task for them. Intelligent wearables um, are robot systems that are usually augmenting the person um, and provide situational awareness um, and help the person achieve their objective. And connected devices, again, have the situational awareness, um, but usually don't have any sort of mobility uh, and their goal is to anticipate um, service needs. And so our overall goal is to develop intelligent assistive technology that improves human life. So when we really look at this sort of problem, we focus on um, A, the robot, which you know, is uh, essential to robotics. How does a robot model itself? How can a robot model a complex task? Um, but when you want robots to be collaborators, it becomes really important that they also model the human. And so this graph is gonna come back throughout this talk, um, but this is really the uh, epicenter of the types of questions that we ask. So here is a um, actually partial list of um, the graduate and master's students uh, in uh, the ARM lab currently, and they work on a host of different projects. So uh, let's start off by thinking about the timeline of robotics itself. So in the 80s up till about the 2000s, you know, when you thought of a robot, you thought of a system that was helping with automation. So doing some repetitive task, possibly on an assembly line. And it was extremely important that those robots be very precise when they executed their task. We saw the uh, movement toward autonomy where now the robots had to perceive unstructured environments and understand their place in it in order to function well. We saw the onset of swarm technology, centralized systems, uh, and then even decentralized systems where these big teams of robots need to work together in order to accomplish a larger goal. And now in the past decade, uh, we've been approaching uh, augmentation. So how can these robots work effectively with human counterparts when there might be limited communication? So what does effective human robot collaboration possibly look like? Um, I'll give a few examples um, that are actually very pertinent because they're actually projects within my lab. Uh, and they include possibly wanting robots to work with humans to carry objects. You can imagine a wearable system where you want to detect um, where a person will walk, possibly to alert them that they might possibly fall. Uh, you might want a robot to be able to learn how to do a new task uh, and work alongside a person, such as carrying boxes from one location to another. You might want to have an intelligent prosthetic um, that can interpret a human's intent given the environment and limited inputs from the person to execute a task. You might want to have shared autonomy between a robot here, a vehicle, uh, and a person so that uh, the system knows when and how to transfer control between the human and the robot. And maybe even more passively in that sort of connected uh, devices um, uh, phase, if you want to have a system that can help observe the environment and do interpretation to help a person understand the people in the environment around them. So we're going to focus on three main questions. The first being, what makes an effective collaborator? What tools do we have in robotics and what do we need to make the robots effective collaborators? And finally, what must be considered for human robot teams? So what makes an effective collaborator? So here is a, 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 a a good motivating video of a swarm of robots. Here, they're coordinated quad rotors that are flying together and they all know where to be because there is um, an Oracle, a single system that's telling every agent where to go. Here you can see that as a sort of base station that's commanding them where to go. And this is being achieved through digital um, communication. But as these teams might possibly get larger, um, it might actually be too much for a single Oracle um, to handle. And that limitation might be due to computational complexity or even just range. Um, if you imagine all of these uh, quadrators that you see here, if they were to expand in their function or even be over an entire city, um, it might actually be very difficult for an Oracle to govern the second to second or millisecond to millisecond action. And so they have to be decentralized 
um, and communicate with each other to achieve that. But again, if you look at what the state of the art is, a lot of this is in fact um, digital communication as a method to drive this. And we'll talk later about how these robots themselves even reach the sort of consensus, um, which is the shared plan, agreement on a shared plan. But the problem definitely gets harder if you think about wanting to collaborate with biological systems or agents. So here you have an example of uh, basketball players that are working very well to do an operation tempo, op tempo uh, task here of scoring on these teammates in a very fast uh, play. And they clearly don't have digital communication. So what makes an effective team? I would postulate that this includes having shared goals and objectives among teammates, the ability to model teammates' behavior um, for prediction, and finally, the ability to plan given personal and teammate roles. So clearly communication is extremely important um, in, this, uh, in this paradigm of teamwork. And if you think about biological systems here, like these um, collies that are um, herding these ducks for sport into the ring, as you see here, um, usually the three main areas are audio, vision, and tactile. Um, so if you have audio communication, this allows for extremely high specificity, um, you know, such as giving this talk and passing information, um, but it can be very slow. And if you have a very fast operation, that might not be adequate. Um, and it's very sequential. I speak, then you speak. If you consider vision, um, this can be done mutually. We can directly observe each other. And so the information exchange can be extremely fast, as you see in this video, um, and very detailed. So here, this is uh, sort of instantaneously, they're watching each other, the dogs are watching each other and knowing what they should do in order to achieve the desired behavior. But you can also observe um, a very complex description through um, vision, visual observation as well. So all of us are very familiar with how honeybees are actually able to perform a dance and that is visually observed by um, the other insects in order to know how to operate and find um, a target um, location. Finally, for tactile, um, touch and forces can be a communication method or modality that's extremely fast. Here you see um, how quickly the uh, out, uh, outcome of this score is able to be conveyed um, to um, the person who is learning that information through tactile feedback. But here a key uh, requirement is that um, proximity uh, must be bounded. You have to be close enough right, to touch the person. So a few key features for teamwork, um, I would say are role understanding and interagent trust. So role understanding uh, will classify as given the actions of others, what is my role? Uh, and is my role unique given the task? Here, the robot joins the circle. Is this the only place it could join? If another were not in their place, could it swap with their location? What's the role of this new agent? And interagent trust um, is essentially the conditions you need before you take action and you know that um, your actions will not lead to some suboptimal behavior. This is the main primary assumptions you're basing this on. And they consist on, of having an agreed objective and a known behavioral model. So for this uh, case with these two cars, um, the basis for the red car trusting the blue car is it believes that the blue shares the objective that it doesn't want to collide and the behavioral model that to achieve that objective, the blue will maintain a particular velocity. And based on that trust, um, the red may take the action of changing lanes. So what are the limitations when you think of these types of systems? So we clearly see that, you know, limited communication modality, you can clearly share a lot more if you could be digital. You have limited dexterity and strength to weight ratio and possibly limited perception. But how does biological systems actually overcome these? They do this through understanding um, the role of the given team and for the task. They think about that task modeling. How do you model the task? And they think about that teammate uh, modeling as well. So if we kind of want to match these two things together and make robots these sort of super effective teammates, the next question we need to ask is what tools do we already have in robotics that can make robots effective uh, collaborators? So I'll break these into three main categories um, that are worthy of note, you have proprioception and control or this sort of knowledge of self. You have perception where you're sensing the environment 
you could think of computer vision or tactile sensing um, and intelligence or the ability to model and make decisions. So going into proprioception and control, um, this is, does the robot know where it is in space? So these are pretty easy. This is more hardware. You can think of your encoders that are able to sense your forward kinematics. And if you have a model of yourself, how much do each one of your links weigh? Um, what is your torque or input capacity? Um, you can quickly model the dynamics of your system here. The torque is your input. You have an inertia, uh, Coriolis and centrifugal terms and possibly gravity. Um, on our way towards control, this also means you need to know how to move um, within yourself, possibly without avoiding self-collision. Um, so motion planning becomes a really important part. If you think of systems like manipulators, um, usually for high dimensional systems, you kind of find yourself in this sampling um, category in order to achieve um, your target pose. And finally, control. Um, how does the state change given a uh, function of what the state currently is and your choice of inputs. Again, for a manipulator, you can think of torques um, at every joint. So digging a little bit deeper into the space of controls, particularly if you're interacting with your environment, because um, again, we're thinking about this sort of tactile sensing. Can you feel a force being applied or how do you react to your environment doing force on you? Um, two primary ones for this sort of contact um, scenario is impedance and admittance control where essentially impedance, the goal of impedance is to have a desired um, dynamical system, particular mass that you wanna have the system behave as if that's how much mass it had and resist motion, um, impeding motion. And for admittance control, you wanna say, if I have some target behavior and I have some input, I wanna actually admit that behavior. I wanna move in the way that's being asked of me. And depending on your different scenario, um, one of these or both of these might be um, useful. So you can think of an impedance case where if you wanna actually push a door open, um, you wanna actually have a particular amount of force you wanna apply. So impedance is great, but if you're interacting with a human and you were to think about safety and you were to accidentally bump them, you definitely wanna have an admittance controller. In the space of uh, perception, uh, you can think of camera sensing as being extremely important here. You see autonomous vehicle, uh, camera looking at its surroundings, able to classify the different elements that are present. You can think of laser range finders that are able to um, literally send out light um, and use that um, reflection to give you information about your environment with precise distances, if other conditions are allowed. Um, and finally, tactile sensors, right? So sensors that can actually feel forces, possibly both normal and shear um, in their environment. So in our lab, we realized that this tactile sensors is a really big barrier to having robots really present in your home. And so we asked the question, right, what does it take to really get us there? And so here on the left, you see this video of this plays. Uh oh, excuse me, that crashed. Uh, well, you had a video of uh, one arm that was actually manipulating an object. And on the right, uh, we have a video of gel site that'll be back in one moment, um, but is really using vision to actually look at the boundary of a sensor to give you information about it. One moment as it pulls up. And so that's really the question, right? So the first video that we were looking at, um, you had this, this robot that was capable of uh, manipulating an object in hand, but the way that that actually worked was they had external cameras that were looking at the uh, Rubik's cube and they had spent hours in training, learning how to um, actually manipulate that object in hand without it dropping out of um, the robot's hand. So if you really look at this sort of space of uh, manipulators and where we've come, um, the state of the art for quite a while was these sort of biotech sensors. Um, so they have smaller resolution than these vision-based sensors, um, but they're uh, really effective. Then we have the onset of like gel site. Uh, and so here, uh, this is the digit um, using gel site and it has a camera inside that's looking at that flat surface you see there and it's able to detect impressions there that give it both normal and shear forces, uh, but it's very flat. So we call that a 2D shaped vision based sensor. And we finally have this um, 3D shaped vision based sensor here um, coming out of Berkeley Omnitac where there are tiny uh, micro cameras looking everywhere. So locally they see a flat image because they're so close to the surface, um, but the whole sensor itself is curved um, in 3D. 
So um, in our lab for this work in tactile sensing, uh, we really realized that we can break this whole thing up into three main questions, the design, the modeling, and the motion planning. So we're asking, can we uh, leverage um, anthropomorphic inspiration and curved fingertips um, that are capable of deforming and sensing friction to drive our design? For modeling, can we effectively model a continuously curved fingertip um, with high resolution um, and characterize stable grasps? And finally, if we have that design and that model, can we leverage this efficient continuous model of our fingertip to plan multi-finger grasps for in-hand manipulation? So uh, this um, uh, work uh, performed by my PhD student, Wang Kim Du, um, really looks at how can we make this curved uh, sensor design. And after a few iterations, we converged on actually using a fisheye lens, looking at a curved um, hemispherical uh, fingertip where the radius center for um, the fisheye lens and the sensor um, are shared. And it gives us some really nice features in terms of um, our uh, image model for the system. And so this whole sensor and whole setup is pretty low cost um, and has some really cool features and so far has been performing quite well for us. And so you can kind of see the LEDs which are inside that are rotating um, for um, contact. Um, so they're moving really slowly so you can see them, but in uh, real time when we would do them, they would be moving much faster, closer to the rate of the camera. And the idea of having such a system perform this um, really allows us to um, observe the shadowing that's produced when you actually um, imprint on the surface. So in the middle figures and on the left, you can see this sort of uh, notion. And so if the uh, camera, uh, if the LEDs actually rotate, then this can give us a whole bunch of perspectives to compare um, so that we can actually get a particular impact, a sort of quasi-static impact um, from multiple points of view. And so right now um, we're going one step further to say, um, can we actually calibrate this um, and actually know the depression as well as the forces mm -hmm. given um, our system. So um, once this design has been completed and finalized, uh, we'll move on to modeling and motion planning as well. And some ideas for this are, if you have this ability to measure the normal and shear forces, which these type of vision sensors give you, um, and if the surfaces um, uh, actually soft and can conform to whatever it is that you're contacting, then through vision, you can actually determine how the surface was deformed and what the forces, both normal and shear, were everywhere. And this is the basis of what you need to actually build what we call a wrench cone, which essentially tells you how much um, force you can apply and moments you can apply before slipping occurs. And particularly what's nice about these vision-based sensors is besides just seeing the boundary um, uh, because you can actually see the depression, you can know where you are inside of the wrench cone. And so if you want to plan in-hand manipulation, similar to the sliding work, um, where they actually were having a, a non-zero velocity for us, we're thinking about in-hand manipulation, so zero velocity. Um, but you can use these sets of motion clones to, to plan your overall action. And so if you think about competing methods that just directly jump in with RL um, and don't have the benefit of these sort of motion cones, um, or wrench cones, um, it's gonna take them a lot longer to learn. But if we can mathematically represent these, we think this is a tool that will cut down the rate of learning um, for these other methods um, uh, exponentially. So the last phase I'll talk about for them uh, in, the, in the ones that I mentioned is intelligence, right? And so if you think about all the different types of uh, models you can use, and we'll, we'll focus specifically on tools that you would use um, for predicting the behavior or actions of either yourself or other agents, um, notably uh, commented as trajectory forecasting, they break down into a few different categories. And I love this breakdown um, coming out of Marco Pavone's lab uh, here at Stanford. You have ontological methods, which believe that there's some underlying structure to how the decisions are being made or how the state is changing. And those can be state-space models or internal cost functions. And then you have on the other side, um, these uh, phenomenological uh, methods, these data-driven structures. So these can be deterministic regressors or even uh, generative um, approaches. And so based on what you, uh, what you actually have in these assumptions that you're making about your system, some may be better um, than others. And a lot of our work, we assume that um, there may not be, particularly because we're trying to predict behavior, these really nice ontological methods um, we may be able to pull from, and this pushes us more and more toward these sort of generative um, approaches. 
So finally, thinking about where robots are and where you know we'd like to be, you know, common algorithms for uh, cooperation for robots um, can be categorized as either having an oracle that's telling all agents what to do. Um, all agents could, in fact, act independently toward a predetermined goal and not really interact, but just assume that everyone knows what they should do and where they should be. And then finally, you, you have consensus through voting systems um, in terms of the digital space where they share information and they converge on a solution or an action um, based on that shared information. Um, but most of these implementations are conditioned on the availability, the availability of digital communication. And so this is something that we have to rethink when you wanna actually have a human in the loop. And so what must be considered for these human robot teams? So again, that key challenge for the human robot team is digital communication may not be available, right? So what do robots need to be effective teammates for humans? I postulate that they need the ability to model complex tasks, the ability to interpret and manipulate environments configured for humans, and finally, the ability to model teammates' actions and roles. So I believe you can also uh, further kind of categorize uh, robot collaborators as wearables um, and an external uh, collaborator, where one is augmenting the human and the other is kind of performing like a partner. And so in the wearable space, um, you actually can see um, the ability to substitute um, uh, substituting device. So this uh, wearable is actually performing the function of part of you, um, or perhaps an ability enhancing device such as a phone. So let's get into um, the ability uh, substituting uh, devices. So here you actually see um, a human on the left and I can kind of think of this control diagram where the human has some cognition, they're planning what they wanna do, their brain knows what kind of controller they need to execute it. You send that to your body, those electrical signals to your body, which acts, and then you have some sensory feedback um, that's telling you what happened after you took that action. And so for particularly for wearables, the question we need to ask is what part of the human being is being augmented or substituted? And if we do, is the robot augmentation functioning adequately? Uh, and does the presence of the robot feel natural or easy to use? So to answer this, uh, my PhD student Shivani Guptasarma um, and uh, master students Gabriella here, they are looking at um, what we call the intelligent prosthetic arm. So traditionally in uh, the space of upper limb prosthetics, um, you have some powered prosthetics and others that are um, body powered as you see here. Um, for um, sh uh, shoulder disarticulation uh, amputees. And as you see, um, this can be very challenging for them to manipulate, even though they're actually doing a fantastic job, just the limited dexterity um, can just take them longer to perform some tasks. So we're thinking, how can robotics actually help? Uh, and if you can kind of zoom in here on the center figure, um, we're proposing um, a powered arm um, that's informed by um, the person wearing EMG signals um, leveraging augmented reality um, and um, a robot arm that's outfitted with the ability to perceive the environment as well. So kind of exploding um, that methodology and going back to that original figure um, I put on like the second slide uh, here, you know, how does the robot sense the person, right? You have these EMG measurements. That's how the human is um, sending information to the robot. But what's really difficult a lot of times is ascertaining human intent. And that line between the human and the environment is usually very difficult to sort of intercept. And so augmented reality, mixed reality that has both the ability to portray information to the person, as well as extract information from what they're focusing on can be a key tool in intersecting that component between the human and the uh, task and environment, which can allow us to better model um, the human because we understand what they're thinking about with the environment and how they're interacting directly with us, the robot. So let's go back to that sort of um, control diagram. You have that cognition, which is a planner controller. Um, you're sending some uh, electromyography signals, some impulses to your muscles, which are your actuators. Your body has some dynamics that it acts through and you have some sensory feedback, touch and vision. So clearly we have all of these capabilities, maybe to a lesser ex extent in some cases, um, but present in robotics, cognition, 
right? The ability to plan and control, you know, plant and actuator, body dynamics, sensory feedback, touch, and vision. So if I look at this sort of expanded um, uh, 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 control diagram, the planner, controller, actuator, body dynamics, vision, touch, um, and this is all interacting with your environment and task on a bigger control loop, if you will. Uh, then if you have a prosthesis, this means that the actuator and body dynamics are usually not uh, available, right? And so someone with just a simple prosthesis would command a robotic prosthesis um, through, uh, say, EMG. If you think about a powered reflex, possibly with some basic reflexes, like maybe heat or contact, um, then maybe you want to outfit that prosthesis with the ability to have some sensory feedback, like vision or touch. So if the person is moving and they impact with the wall, it might respond immediately, um, but it doesn't really think, and the person is still controlling with EMG. Finally, you can even have a system where the person has the ability to plan and control, um, but the robot also, using the vision and touch of the environment, can also um, understand its role and can help the human um, to be um, uh, less cognitive load for the person who's using uh, the system. Um, as I was mentioning before, augmented reality is a very powerful tool um, that can allow the robot to both extract and present information to the wearer. So the top uh, two left corner images really show how um, with devices like the HoloLens 2, you can actually perform gaze tracking and see what the person is um, looking at or thinking about. Uh, you can kind of model that as sort of a conic area of focus, uh, which can be very helpful um, when ascertaining what the person actually wants to manipulate. Um, and then if you have knowledge about your environment, um, such as affordances or the pose, if you're tracking them or scene understanding, this can all be very useful and provide information back to the wearer. So I wanna set this kind of scene for you, if, if you will, um, on how you can imagine the system ultimately working. So um, let's look at this um, activity of daily living, ADL, of uh, drinking some fluid with a pitcher of water to refill your cup and uh, feeding yourself from this plate of food. And you have the simple state machine here on the right. Um, so, you know, when you're getting ready to start off, you have two choices. You could grasp the pitcher or you could grasp the fork. Um, here, this little circle with a plus sign designates where the person's area of focus is, let's say from just um, the uh, AR uh, is focusing on. And then that allows you to actually put more weight on the state machine to transitioning to pouring, uh, say, the pitcher. And so when you're pouring the pitcher, uh, you have two options. You could be um, either filling the cup or replacing the pitcher, um, but maybe vision isn't as helpful in this scenario. So maybe here's where you might actually wanna rely more on EMG to kind of signal which one of these operations at a high level you're trying to perform. And then uh, once it's replaced, you know, options you might logically go to from there are drinking from the, food, uh, from the cup or possibly manipulating um, the fork. And if you were continuing to eat, you might trigger this process, this internal process to eat. Um, and if you observe the plate of food, um, this planning of where the fork should go next could be largely handled by the system. So hopefully I've kind of set the scene for you here about a very practical way um, this system could uh, ultimately be used. So let's define a few variables. We have the state of the system, um, S, the gaze, G, the EMG signal, E, some desired action AI and the probability that the human wants to do a particular action. And we assume that um, that set of actions is uh, finite and uh, the probability over them sums to one. So the question uh, is we would like to predict the wearer's intent based on the state and behavior. So what action do they wanna take given the state of the system, given the input from the EMG, given their gaze? Um, and we realize that we want to do that by modeling the human's behavior. What are they doing with their EMG and gaze, given the states and available actions? Um, and then have a more seen sort of contextual understanding. What kind of actions would you would expect to take, given the state of the system? And so from uh, Bayes' rules, we actually have um, the following relation right, that the probability of your action given the EMG gaze and state is equal to this um, relationship um, between the reliance of the uh, electromyography, the gaze on the action in the state, both together and independently on the state, as well as the human intent model, what action you would take 
in a given state um, scenario. And so if you have these probabilities, um, if you want to predict their intent, you simply take the argmax over that probability, and this tells you what action you might expect the, per, uh, the person wants to take. So at this point, right, this has been a well-phrased problem, and you can actually branch off into many ways to solve this. Um, uh, uh, generative approaches, variational autoencoders, particularly conditional variational autoencoders have kind of risen to the top in a lot of literature as being a really nice way to solve these type of problems, but definitely not the only way. Um, but here I'll present it here briefly um, as the method we're choosing to go forward with. So X here is your input, Z is your latent space, and Y is your output. So here you have these arrows, the black and red uh, on the left here that indicate um, the, the testing process and the red indicate um, the training process. Um, and here, there are a lot of resources you can read that really looks at um, the mechanics of this implementation. Um, but simply at the top, you want to predict what is your output given your input, and you can represent that in your latent space uh, with the following parameter and distributions. And so for our task, right, to actually solve our problem, we, need, we realize we need to actually calculate renditions of the following um, uh, models. What is the probability of an action given the state and probability of the um, input given the state or given the state and the action. So you could actually have a, a separate one there that is just the state as well. So what's really nice is because we can actually separate these and combine them at the end, um, that separation ability actually might mean that if we're very careful on how we choose our states, we can actually train these things independently. So here you can imagine training an ADL or a task with augmented reality with able-bodied individuals that can put in a whole lot of work and benefit um, the amputee com uh, uh, community by actually putting in that work and training those models. Um, and then on the other side, um, similar to conventional prostheses, we can actually calibrate by collecting behavioral data um, for these specified actions. And so you can imagine if you had this sort of setup with the uh, 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 an AR system, your EMG and your prosthetic, um, if someone has trained how to do a whole set of tasks and maybe there's a library or an app store of tasks, right? Then on the other side, if you can perform a lot of calibration routines, which cover the space of the actions you would need to do, um, then you only need to do that sort of calibration to calibrate your gaze and EMG to, to those actions if you were directly requested to do them. And now your system can quickly connect to, this, to, the, to the larger space of demonstrated abilities. Um, and that's our hope to uh, actually provide um, a great resource um, in this space. And so that's our objective for the space. And we're in the process of implementing this uh, now starting off with a virtual environment, a virtual prosthetic arm performing virtual tasks. So um, on the other side here, you have, instead of ability replacing devices, you also can imagine ability enhancing devices. So in the ability enhancing devices, usually this kind of falls under the category of improving some sort of sensory uh, feedback concerning the world. So uh, one project that we're working on here uh, with my master's and undergrad students, Junwoo, uh, Luciana, um, and our, our, our undergrad student here, um, what we're doing is we're actually looking at fall prediction and prevention using um, a smart belt. So the motivation here is the falls are the leading cause of fatal uh, and non-fatal injuries in older adults age 65 plus. So the question we ask is if these falls can be predicted, can they also be mitigated um, using a wearable sensor that observes the person and the environment? And so this isn't really new. There's similar work, um, elderly fall risk assessment um, and prediction based on gate analysis. But a lot of this is an online work. They're not predicting if a fall is gonna be happening on some significant time horizon. And even those that do are looking at less than a second or even on the millisecond scale. But we're saying if you can see far out in the environment, um, what's stopping you from trying to predict if down the road uh, you might be able to predict the person might be at risk of falling. And so uh, if you observe the person's gait and surroundings, can you predict the path that they will take, what the gait is gonna be over that path and the associated risk of falling given that path and gait. And here we, we the, the actual metric we take for that is the orientation of their torso. What's the sway or particularly what's the variance of the sway to characterize instability. And so um, the idea would be to um, have on the person 
um, a uh, camera, an IMU that is going to be in the final deployment that you just have to wear around your waist. Um, and then we would train um, in order to allow such a system to correctly estimate the environment, the odometry, the gait, and orientation of the wearer. And once those were successfully implemented, um, then the objective would be to use these inputs um, with um, some sort of uh, sequential method like an LSTM uh, to actually predict um, the future trajectory, gait, and orientation, which is associated with the fall risk of the person. Um, again, on this sort of ability enhancing device and more to the connected devices under a uh, realm is our ASL to English translation mobile um, uh, application. So the idea we have here is, you know, if you really think about a lot of translation apps, a lot of them all clearly uh, verbal, and um, in the global community, it has been a, a raising concern. How can we actually have a good um, uh, automatic, uh, automatic interpreter for um, ASL back to English? There are a lot of things, uh, companies such as Handtalk that are able to go the other way. You say what you wanna say and it shows you what the signs are, but going the other way, um, there's not a lot of resources in that space. And those that do, as you can see here on this reference chart, uh, really require a lot of uh, GPU overhead. And so if you want to think about this being deployable, like carrying this ability in your pocket, um, we need to do something clever um, in order to achieve that. Um, and so that's where our solution space is. How can we actually do this on the mobile um, computing scale? And so to achieve this, um, we're actually uh, leveraging um, uh, transformers to actually um, characterize what the spoken words are. And we're doing pre-processing on our video data which includes um, the ability of extracting the person's facial expressions and hands. Um, and um, now we're actually much better at doing the torso as well um, and correlating those to um, the expected output from the words. And so if you can do that, you can imagine being far more efficient in terms of computation on your system because you're not dealing with raw videos. Now you're dealing with a subset of key points that can be very uh, uh, essential for that. So moving to the space of um, external collaborators. Here, uh, this is work um, that's uh, in collaboration with the Iliad Group and CS, Dorsa Sadiq, um, my uh, PhD uh, student, Eli uh, Ng, Albert, uh, and JD. We're here, our goal of this project is to model the cooperative ability of human-human interaction and transport and transfer it to a robotic assistant in order to produce an effective transport teammate. So we realized to be effective for this, we need to go back to that term of interagent trust, right? Uh, which we defined before. If you can uh, model the other person's or the other teammates behavior and actions, then you can understand better your role in order to carry um, effectively. And so in uh, one version of this application, we're thinking, can you predict where your partner wants to go given where you've been as a team, S, and the actions you both have mutually taken as well as the environment O. In this other space of an external um, collaborator here, we have um, this uh, project, Efficient Learning from Demonstration and Collaboration um, with Aaliyah Smith and Manuel Ratana. Um, and here the goal is to say, A, uh, you know, if you imagine a scenario where you, know, you have first responders, you wanna do a duty in an unstable environment, you wanna move things, but maybe it's not safe to send a whole bunch of first responders into a space. Maybe it would be great to send a few first responders and more robots. Uh, and there are many application spaces you can kind of think of that where if the uh, robot were able to work alongside a person, you could reduce risks to that person um, or people. And so there are two main objectives um, within this set of uh, problems here. One is, can the human efficiently teach a robot a new task by identifying critical states using AR? And secondly, uh, given the described tasks, can the robot collaborate to learn the human behavioral model and leverage it to take action that optimizes performance for the entire team. So here on uh, the uh, right, you see, um, imagine the case of opening a door. Um, if you go back to one of those Google papers, they actually had hundreds, like a bunch of robots opening a door many, many times to be successful. And a huge problem with RL and learning from demonstration is really the state space, right? But if I were able to define to the robot, what were the important states it should be paying attention to? You have a rigid object, which is a door. You have a constraint, which is the hinge. You have the handle as another rigid object, and it is constrained. 
related to the door. Now there are four things you need to be paying attention to. And if you operate these in this particular sequential action uh, or, or state space action, then you can achieve your objective. And so then even uh, transferring this to new abilities, you need to be looking for these corresponding elements um, will allow robot to understand these tasks a lot more efficiently. And that brings a lot of power uh, from the AR side. And on the second objective here, if you have these sort of behavioral models where you can predict the action the human would take given the set, maybe their actions are suboptimal, right? If the human carries a heavier box or all the heavier boxes that the robot could have been carrying, then if you sum this up over the entire operation, it's gonna just take longer because the human was doing suboptimal actions. So maybe if you realize the human has a tendency to carry our heavy things, you should jump in and carry those heavier things for the robot. So you could think of um, any sort of POMTP, you know, belief tree solver using their model to propagate forward and uh, explore different trees and then determine what best action you should take that will lead to optimality for the entire team where you're kind of playing their scenario in your mind. And this should ring some bells for you, I think, in terms of game theory approaches, but usually in those methods, um, it's adversarial, right? You're trying to beat the person here. You're asking, what can I do to be an effective, a more effective teammate and bring more optimality to the team? Uh, this sort of thinking can be applied to the case of shared autonomy, right? So if you actually look at the space of autonomous vehicles, um, a lot of it as we approach level five and six autonomy is these cars will become really smart and we'll just hand over control and we can just actually just rip the steering wheel out and we don't need this anymore. Uh, and so I personally disagree. I think we will always want to drive cars, especially as they get uh, newer, faster, sleeker, you know, and Elon Musk puts out the best, next best Tesla, we're going to want to drive it, period. <laughs> and so if you want to think about how you can actually get the best of both worlds, it becomes quite to think about how uh, handover and control can be both safe and smooth. Um, and uh, on top of that, right, uh, you know, ARC has been warning us for a long time that there's going to possibly be some reason you want to take over. I don't subscribe to that, but um, let's, let's cater to that and build for this uh, eventuality. So uh, leveraging human intent for shared autonomy, uh, if you kind of think of this controller and plant paradigm, um, here you have MH, which is a model of the uh, human, you have MR, which is the action policy of the robot. You're asking what action would the human take given the states of the system and the actions that the robot has taken to date? What's the state transition model? And what is the human action policy? So what's really fantastic with this sort of setup is as you're driving, if you have a model of the human, before you actually hand over control and let it be just a Boolean switch, um, as you might do in a lot of shared autonomy literature, if you actually just observe their input for a while, you can say, does this input match to a safe set? So let's say you're on the highway and you're driving around a curve. There's a particular range or variance that's allowable in the gas pedal and a particular range and variance that's allowable in the steering angle um, to actually maintain safe control. So if you have a disconnected input and the human is um, driving as if they were actually driving, you can monitor over some finite amount of time what their input is. And if it matches to the safe set, then you know you can actually blend the control input safely from the robot to the human, right? And if um, you're going the other way, um, possibly handing over control at non-zero speeds from the human to the robot, vice versa, right? If something's going on and perhaps the robot doesn't sense um, something in its path, it can react um, in an efficient way. And particularly, um, again, AR can play a really big role because in addition to um, risk presentation, right? You can imagine um, the robot's plan also being displayed in a sort of holographic way in the future in these sort of windshields. And I think that's really critical for self-driving cars um, for us to actually build and maintain trust of these vehicles. So if you see something or someone getting ready to walk in your path and the car is able to efficiently convey its plan to you, you can actually detect um, hopefully uh, a non-frequent but possible fault. Right, and that would actually cue you in that you might need to take some action before the risk was in fact imminent. So some takeaways, um, to be effective collaborators with humans, robots must be able to model human behavior and their role. 
There's significant room for improvement in robotic hardware for alternate forms of communication, such as audio, visual, or tactile. And robotic collaborators have the potential to expand their human teammates' capabilities, which will enhance and restore quality of life. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will um, copy paste. For those who are in the audience, please feel free to submit any questions for Monroe to the Google form here. Uh, for those who are panelists, the 20 or so faculty and PhD students here, please feel free to just unmute and, and ask the question directly. Uh, I will start with one that I've been wondering about. It seems like one real strength of sort of what I'll call the mechanical engineering approach here is that you have um, firm models of how the world works, where I think, you know, a lot of a lot of us in computer science, you know, just argue for sort of the unfair um, success of pure, just like get data and let the model figure it out. And the, I really like the idea of trying to blend the two. That seems like intuitively it's probably the right answer. I wonder um, how we manage it when, you know, there, okay, so in the data-driven environment, we have this issue of like, well, what happens when we, you know, when there's a distribution shift, right? So we train over here and then we see something we've never seen before and then we do something silly. On the other hand, when we're in a model-driven world, like you talked about, you know, opening the door, we can model in a particular way. What do we do there when we see something we've never seen before? We have no closed form model for it. Like how, how would you think about trying to address these sort of um, new experiences in, in this kind of a world? So that's, that's a great question. Um, and I think it has quite a few parts to it um, and brings up a point that I think is really important. I think ultimately, right, the, at the very basis of your question is, um, what if your model is just wrong, right? Um, if you have an anal analytical model that's just wrong, there's a scenario you've never seen, it's just not present, um, you're gonna suffer the same way as if you um, had a data-driven model, right? So I think fundamentally, um, if you observe a scenario you've never seen before and it's not reflected in your model, you have issues, right? And then the question is simply, how do you adapt? So like in, you know, the more mechanical slash controls paradigm, you know, you kind of see the literature shifting to, you know, adaptive control techniques or stochastic control where we realize, okay, we may not always know the answer and even robust control, but we can sometimes, you know, double down on our model or adapt, right? Um, and so... I think from that kind of standpoint, there's a lot of parallel because the fundamental issue beyond the approach is still the same, right? Whatever model you initially had is just not being reflected in what you're observing. Um, I think, however, there's a deeper point I'd like to make, which is um, a risk that happens if you um, uh, don't really approach the modeling the correct way. So if I, if I were to give you a very large, um, you know, and I like to think of this in sort of a manifold um, sort of space, the dynamics, given some state, what is some outputs, right? If you think of this as a manifold, right? If you um, have a, uh, a few inputs, right? That you say, okay, in this, in this particular uh, range, I'm confident on how I'm actually modeling my system. Um, but further out, right? It may perform less accurately. Uh, the key, even in regular dynamics or even in physics, right, is to actually, you see us uh, develop analytical models that do a much better job of ex explaining the sort of quantum uh, feature, if you will, um, of whatever it is we're trying to um, describe, right? If you think about a dynamical model, I can take um, some really, you know, uh, big uh, uh, description of how the state space is changing, but if I try to move toward generalized coordinates, I'm saying, what's the most essential thing I need to know in order to predict the behavior? How can I make my model as concise and generalizable as possible so that it is both accurate where I've seen it demonstrated as well as further out? And I'll make a high level claim that, you know, even in terms of cognitive thinking, we do the same thing. You know, physicists, if they're explaining some phenomenon, you know, that's way out in space, they're actually, their model descriptions are actually going smaller to predict larger outcomes that are further away. Robots need to do the same thing, right? When we observe the space, our models need to become more quantum, smaller, accurate, smaller models that are accurate everywhere in order to expect them are generalizable and in order to expect them to be, um, to behave even further away from where we did. And I, I would say, you know, one kind of big step in that direction is even variational 
you know, autoencoders, right? You know, this is saying I'm looking at this state, this system, and I'm asking, can I compress that information into its most condensed form and then use that to extrapolate back to how, you know, the world behaves or the key aspects of how the world behaves. And so I think, you know, at, at every level of cognition from, you know, low level action controllers to high level planners, or even, you know, if you want robots to think about bigger questions, we need to follow the trends that humans do, which is make your models accurate and small and generalizable uh, so that they can extend beyond the space that you see them, which means you truly understand the underlying manifold that you're trying to represent. And do you, as just a quick follow up on that, do you think that the approach here is going to be different in terms of dealing with unanticipated, unanticipated phenomena in the physical world versus unanticipated phenomena, sort of human behavior world? I think physics definitely gives you the benefit that um, if you stay at a particular scale, things can be considered deterministic <laughs> and that can, that can definitely help. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of times there are rules that govern just about everything, right? You know, true randomness is actually, you know, you don't really see that a lot. There's some, usually some big guiding principles um, and particularly in robotics where you want to take action and make decisions based on some phenomenon, you're assuming usually that there is some underlying um, description, model description that is there to be obtained, right? Um, so I think that's, that's uh, important there. Yeah. Cool. I will um, stop dominating the floor if there are any panelists or anyone who wants to jump in with a question. I have more, more, more to ask, but I, I feel like this is not a two-person conversation. I, I have a question. So thanks so much, Monroe, for this really exciting and, and very diverse talk of lots of different uh, topics. I think that is certainly, uh, you know, intersects between robotics, human robot interaction. And uh, yeah, I see a lot of overlap with HCI topics as well. I'm wondering, you know, as you think about closing this loop between, uh, you know, basically putting the human in the loop more and a lot of these assistive robotic systems, what do you think the the role of that augmented reality um, you know system can be and you know are there ways to to use that in a in a you know more direct control sense to be able to provide you know visual feedback to someone in terms of you know how they might think about using their you know sensory motor control system as opposed to you know kind of the higher level of kind of uh, you know basically this is the the planning or or whatnot. Are there ways to you know uh, kind of bring that more in the in this uh, tighter loop that you showed? Yeah. So I guess um, just rephrasing it to make sure I understand it. You know your question completely. So you know thinking about you know how AR can play a bigger role in these sort of you know feedback control loops. How can it actually play a role on lower level controls um, for a particular system? So I think mm -hmm. absolutely um, they definitely have the ability to do that. Um, I would kind of refer back to that kind of human control loop um, idea again, right? How does our vision directly correlate to actions that we take? Um, I think, you know, on a very fundamental level, you know, we have reflexes, you know, so if you see something move into your field of view really quickly, there's clearly that kind of response that you may take. Um, but then on the other side too, you know, we're always looking at information and, and interpreting it and making some decision based on what we see. Um, and what's really fantastic about, you know, where AR is actually um, going um, is you actually have both sides of that, right? You have cameras that are out facing, which are localizing the system as well as observing the environment it can be used for that. And we have a lot of work in computer vision that's really working to have better contextual understandings of environments. Um, and then you have the ability to even ask questions, if you will, to the person by presenting information that you think is important and what they're focusing on, or even hypothetical objects in their scene to see how they would react, right, to this um, sort of uh, um, input, right? So I think with all of that, right, you know, there's how does the, you know, what, what A, what does, what do your eyes see? And B, how does your mind process what it sees to take some action? You know, so I think we're, we're getting well developed on the A part, right, which is what can the eye see and can we interpret that, but modeling how we make decisions based on some, you know, set of assumptions of what we're doing, that's definitely the more difficult problem uh, to solve. But I think by having that sort of interception, right, because 
whatever you're seeing is literally being transformed through the AR if you're doing something while you're wearing it, um, then you can kind of be guaranteed to a point that you're not really missing anything, at least from the vision perspective, because you're intercepting that data directly. So if, it, if they made some de decision based on what they saw, you know the information was present. You just have to figure out what it was and what was the underlying model that led to the actions that they took, right? And then that, that leads to a lot of interesting um, research. One other question that came up, um, I will do my best to proxy it. Basically, putting your work in conversation with some accessibility researchers, including one who we heard last week, um, uh, you know, your work has, seen, has also some accessibility motivations. And one of the, one of the patterns that seems to be recurring across the um, ability-based design space and the accessibility space is that there's essentially a very, very wide space of accessibility needs that it's, you know, sort of bespoke solutions for bespoke problems because the, you know, my, um, my abilities may not match any, you know, the, this one, this person's or that person's or that person's. And I'm wondering again, sort of in, in the approach that you're envisioning, how do we do the kind of manual tuning that we need to, you know, to understand this person's specific model or their own abilities, and then map that onto the kinds of, of support that you that you that you're building. Yeah, that's a fantastic question, um, and one yeah, very important to um, traditional like assistive technology. Um, I think you know when it comes to actually you know deploying systems for people, you know, there's everyone's needs will be a little different, um, and I think that kind of goes against traditional sort of engineering, um, large scale sort of thinking, right? You wanna design a solution that has the maximum impact um, as quickly as you can. Um, so I think what you raised, the point you were, you were raising is how do you uh, think about that sort of adaptiveness from a, a wide scale solution to um, uh, you know, the uh, individual's needs. Um, I think, again, you know, framing it in the context of what you need to do, if I think particularly, let's say about like the prosthetic arm, just for an example, um, the activities of daily living are going to be similar for everyone, right? But generalizability is the key. You know, you may open, you know, different types of cans than another person, or you may have a different type of can opener, but you're still going for the same type of task. So that means if I'm giving a more general solution, I need a solution that A, understands at a high level what you're trying to do, and without too much effort can be adapted to your particular scenario. And that goes both for an outward facing you know, interacting with the environment and an inward facing, right? And that's really important when you think about amputee, uh, amputees because um, every amputation is not going to be exactly the same, right? Where do you actually put the EMG um, feedback sensors in order for them to actually be able to control um, that system, right? And that's going to be different for every single person. So for all of these types of adaptation, I think that can hopefully, if you do your engineering correctly, can be closer to a last step where you have all of these abilities present in this sort of device at the end of the day on this technology. And then the last step is then calibrating that for um, a particular individual. And if you actually look at, you know, the existing sort of powered prostheses that use EMG uh, signals, there is a whole phase that's just centered on calibrating for that person, right? They learn to actuate based on their particular setup. And so I think that kind of last step, particularly for devices that are um, serving these sort of assistive needs like this, um, there will be a level of the system needing to be particularly tuned for each individual. But hopefully, if you create a system that can be very generic and can adapt easily, hopefully the overhead for that can be small and the capabilities, the reward um, can hopefully be large. Thanks. I, I look forward to that future. I think we all do. Um, well, let's thank our speaker one last time. Thank you, Monroe, for joining us. Um, the, we, we look forward to seeing you on campus when we are on campus. And in the meantime, I encourage everyone here, if you're interested in, uh, if you're interested in this space to please uh, reach out to Monroe. You know, we are still distributed, but, but one, big, one big group. So thanks again, and I will uh, end the seminar here. Thank you.